ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of AWP, the Anything Wrestling Podcast. Thank you once again for joining us on another edition of the podcast. Uh, we are coming to you from another uh, with another quarantine edition of the AWP. Again, it is the times of the coronavirus, and everybody's encouraged to stay home and stay safe. We hope everybody is doing just that. It is myself, Dan, the man in the commish. How you guys doing? Not too bad. Not too bad. Uh, you know, just enjoying the quarantine life somehow. Some way. Um, kind of a, I don't know if dark day is the proper way to put it. Kind of a dark day for the WWE. Um, not in the sense of someone passing away or anything like that, but... Um, a lot of superstars, a lot of agents released today from the WWE. Well, I mean, I, I would usually reference this day kind of like what I used to reference with Dan, like after following like a horrible like NFL season with the firing of like general managers and coaches and things like that. So I wouldn't say it's like a dark day or a black day. It's kind of like, like a red Wednesday. <laughs> And I, I mean, and I mean to be fair, I mean I, I do think that it, it sucks, given the fact that we are not even sure if this is going to be the only one. Yeah. And plus, on top of it, before I throw in a plug, it, it, it's not that they're trimming the fat. I mean, because there kind of is a bloated load of fat, but at the same time, I agree with Dan that this could just be like one like uh one round more upcoming yeah um the thing is is that even with the list that i have here it kind of came out in segments where they released the batch and then we got like three names afterwards and then we got another two names afterwards so um pretty fair to say probably at this point we're probably going to get a few more releases um some shocking ones, some not so shocking ones, but before we get into it, uh, go ahead if you guys want to plug anything. So again, it'll it'll be up and running in the next couple of days. The anything underscore wrestling underscore podcast one Instagram. Again, we are working on the name to make it shorter, but you'll notice a lot more posts in regards to not only AWP episodes but also BA Select Start episodes. Um, that's my plug. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm ready to dive right in. Fair enough. And uh, once again, we're talking about superstars who were released. But it, let's just say, if you miss them and you want to catch some of their matches that they had, you can do that only on the WWE Network for a non-negotiable but very reasonable price of just only nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. It's not ten dollars. It's not a thousand dollars. Not a thousand and one. Damn it. Million dollars. But nine ninety nine. Um so let's get on with it. Um I'm gonna first go through the names uh very quickly just so that everybody kinda gets an idea and then we can sort of break it down. So wrestlers, agents, referees, announcers who were released today are No Way Jose, Mike Canellis, Maria Canellis, Primo, Epico, Eric Rowan. Sarah Logan, Carl Anderson, Luke Gallows, EC3, Drake Maverick, Kurt Hawkins, Heath Slater, Eric Young, Leo Rush. Producers, we got Kurt Angle, Billy Kidman, Mike Rotunda, Pat Buck, Fit Finley, Sean Devari, Scott Armstrong, Sarah Stock, Shane Helms, Lance Storm. Uh, announcers, we got Aiden English, and lastly... A shocker, in my opinion. Referees, we got longtime serving referee Mike Kyoto. Now, um, just before we kind of get into, um, you know, every single one of these wrestlers, agents separately, I've kind of said it for a while that if you're not going to do anything with a particular superstar, they're better off uh, being let go. But I kind of thought back and I said, you know, a lot of these guys you could have released a long time ago. Now that there's a pandemic taking over the world, it seems like a bad time to be releasing superstars. So what do you guys think? I mean, pandemic or not, 
let's just say if the pandemic didn't happen. Let's just say coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 never occurred. Anybody ever being fired is always a bad thing because it's it's people who depend on the on this job, whether they come to catering, they come to training, or, you know, they're involved somehow backstage or whatever it is their role is. If they're not on TV, if they still serve a role in the back, it, it's always bad to, like, hear about, oh, someone lost their job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some names on that list do stand out. I, others, it's like, well, it's kind of been foreshadowed. And others, it's like, okay, it finally happened. Yeah. But it's still bad all around. Uh, Dan, what do you think? <laughs> well, the first thing that I, I want to jump out there and say is that I just, I, I think it's funny um, that certain people, uh, now granted, we just saw the release of the revival the other day. Yes. But I think it's interesting that uh, there's a handful of people in this grouping who had been very vocal about maybe WWE should let us go. And so they they wouldn't let the, they wouldn't release them when they asked to be released. Yeah. However, as soon as this thing kicked off, it was like, oh, okay, well, they're the first ones we need to get rid of. When it comes to Vince McMahon as of recent, I always try to think of worst case scenario, as messed up as that sounds. But today in my mind, the first thing that kind of went through was he's probably thinking, you know, Every place is closed down for now. Doesn't seem like anybody's going to become a star while this whole pandemic is going on. Eh, let's just release them, you know, less chance of AEW trying to make a big star in front of empty arenas. That's just kind of what I, you know, first jumped into. But um, and this is a lot of a lot of contracts. So this is going to free up a decent chunk of cash for them to play with, with however they feel they need to. Yeah. Especially with all of those producers, those, like those are, I assume that those producers had pretty nice contracts because of the fact that they did their time and now they were helping run the show. Yeah, and some of them, kind like it hasn't really been a long time for some of the selected names that have been there, you know, backstage as a producer. So to hear them already gone is kind of shocking, but um, let, let's 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 get into it. Let's let's start with the wrestlers. First, we got No Way Jose. Um, I'll just say this. I felt like Jose's uh, gimmick was too gimmicky, if that makes sense. Um, I think everybody just saw a um, Adam Rose 2.0. Um, I never felt like they were really going anywhere with No Way Jose. He was just kind of thrown out there, you know, to pop the crowd and to you know, get fed to, you know, a monster or someone who had debuted or, you know, uh, was on a verge of a push. But uh, I can't say that I'm really shocked about this one. What do you guys think? Didn't he essentially follow the exact same career path as Adam Rose? Because didn't he catch on in NXT and people were like, oh, this is fun. And then they brought him up and it was like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was... Yeah. I, I don't think he was untalented. I just, like you said, it was a little campy, and I think we've kind of, I think we've moved past the day and age where the hyper flamboyant characters tend to catch on. Like Santino Morella, little flamboyant. Uh, yeah. He had he had the uh, the the cobra. And people were like, "Oh, that, this is fun." If, and I think it's because it's a, a pr proportional thing. But when you've got the conga line and you've got the the whatever the hell the rosebud thing was called, <laughs> I, I I think I think that fans of today, especially because there's such such a vocal group of people in our age range at this point, mm -hmm. that those things don't catch on the way that WWE would like them to catch on. Because I don't I don't even think kids catch on to them that much. Right. Yeah. Uh, my, my quick thing on this, if this bit existed in the 90s, it would carry out to 97 and it'd be done. Um, I mean, yeah. Or, I mean, or it, you could have even run it alongside The Godfather, but that, that would have been about <laughs> it. That, 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 that would be interesting. Um, 
Next one, I'm going to group these two together for obvious reasons. Uh, Mike and Maria Kanellis, um, they came in the WWE. Um, I think Mike, for about 2.5 seconds, got a small push. Then, for whatever reason, it was canceled. However, I will say this. I believe that WWE's wellness program helped him overcome uh, his um, alcohol habit that he had. And, you know, they took him to... Um, what do you call it? Uh, rehab. Uh, and there was a full story on it on, on their YouTube. Um, other than that, uh, then you had the whole weird borderline, um, dare I say porno thing going on. It just, it didn't really make sense to me, but what did you guys think? Well, these were the two that I was really like that, them and, and the good brothers who we'll, we'll get to, but the, these were the people I was really referring to when I said it took a it took a pandemic shutting down the company for them to just be let go. Yeah. Um, I I I anticipated that there was going to be more from these two when they first got hired back because, from my understanding, Mike was was a pretty big deal out on the ind- on the independence. Yeah. But. Yeah, they just kind of shot them both in the foot. And like you said, that storyline with the whole, you're my bitch, and now I'm pregnant, and am I really pregnant, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it killed them. <laughs> yeah. So then they're off TV, and now this. So, right. I mean, I, I, I like WWE. I wish them the best in their future endeavors because I just don't think WWE was the right place for them. Yeah. Uh, victims of circumstance. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. Fair enough. Granted, I, think, I think they came over for the WWE paycheck, so hopefully they got enough. Yeah, and, and I believe they just had a baby, so, you know, they can certainly use that money at this point in time. Um, these next two, once again, for obvious reasons, I'm going to group together. Primo and Epico. Um, again, sort of a start, stop, start, stop type of thing where they had one gimmick as a Primo and Epico with um, Rosa Mendez back in the day. Then they got repackaged as Los Matadores. Then they uh, came back again as, uh, what was it, the Shining Stars, uh, you know, handing out pamphlets about great vacation spots. Um, again, I just felt like these guys would just show up here and there, get jobbed out. Uh, there was not really much, you know, that was being done with them. Um, so, yeah, uh, what do you guys think? I'm sorry, is that what their gimmick was, is the Shining Stars for those two minutes? Yeah. They they were vacation, uh, they were travel agents. Pretty you know? much, yeah. <laughs> That's stupid. <laughs> um, th- these guys, again, they were talented, they, uh, I think have a family history in, in the business, uh, but they, they'd fallen off the radar. Yeah. Um. If they get the chance to come back, something that I think would be interesting is, and I know he's a, he's a little older at this point, but I, I think if you could bring these guys and Carlito together, yeah, uh, that would that would be a great way to reintroduce them, and then you could have them be a serious group instead of sort of this comedic pairing. Yeah, uh, I would say the same because. Lately, as, as Sean has put out, there's always this grouping of particular superstars because of their ethnicity. It's like, oh, we'll just put you guys in matches or a grouping or whatever. But if you put these two together with Carlito, rebrand them as like a serious team with the talent they have, I would say give it six months. Yeah. Well, there- they're all actually related, I believe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, it works. <laughs> yeah, and especially at an age where trio tag teams are not really a whole lot, so having them, I think, would be a plus. Um, Take those three and put them against the New Day, that'd be a hell of a feud. Absolutely, I agree. Um, next one, we got Eric Rowan. Um, I think once Wyatt Family 1.0 split, um, Luke and Eric just kind of uh, were just all over the place. One second, they're against each other. The next second, they're brothers again. Then there was Bludgeon Brothers. Then there was Eric Rowan as, as you know Daniel Bryan's manager. And then Luke Harper comes back. 
Um, and then you had the whole spider in a cage gimmick. Um, I thought that Eric Rowan could have been a dominant giant, uh, but it just seemed like once again, everything that he was slapped with became too gimmicky at one point. Um, what do you guys think? Well, okay, so this was this is the first name on my list of the standouts that shocked me because it's like there was talk like he was getting a push. They liked his work. He was really like catching the attention of like the execs in the back. So why not give him, you know, some kind of push? But it's like victim of circus has the bad stories or bad gimmicks, and it's like, well, if we're not going to do anything. And you're praising him. Why don't we just? I would like to see more for him. Maybe, maybe an AEW. Maybe not. I don't know. But that's just me. I I I felt like there could have been a lot more going for Rowan. Yeah. As as for Rowan, like I I don't think that would be a bad move. Is if they if AEW's got the got the budget um, to to bring him over and group him with back with Harper or sorry with Brody Brody Lee yeah I don't know and they could do whatever Brody Lee's doing now or shit if they want to get crazy they could bring him in to be the leader of a different faction and have him have him butt heads but uh I yeah I think he <laughs> he just fell by the wayside after uh after Daniel Bryan Honestly, because even with that, he, he was semi-relevant, but he wasn't he wasn't inspiring. Um, but I also don't think he was ever the greatest. So, yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, not to diminish his work, I always felt like Luke Harper was stood out a little bit more than Eric Rowan, and maybe yeah. and maybe that's just because how he was, you know, what he was given or what storyline, you know, he was given, but. We'll just have to see. Um, next, um, this was kind of a shocker to me, especially because we just saw her on Monday Night Raw. Sarah Logan um, won a, a third of the Riot Squad. Um, uh, not that a Riot Squad ever really, you know, got off the ground running, but uh, I always thought that when these three split, they would all be in their own respective storylines, kind of doing big things. I always felt like she could have, you know, if you didn't have any plans for her, you know, slap her with, um, I'm going to call them War Raiders, uh, not just because she's married um, to Eric, I believe. I always felt like, you know, because she had kind of the Viking gimmick going, they obviously have the Viking gimmick going, you know, if you don't have anything for the least you could do is just slap, you know, her with them, and, you know, maybe somewhere down the line you'll come up with something, but... Um, you know, we saw her lose to Shayna Baszler on Monday, and that was pretty much it. What do you guys think? Again, she she was always sort of the third wheel in the Riot Squad, and I think as long as Riot Squad was was together, all three women were safe. Um, now that we're at this point, I like when I, when the names started to come out, I didn't get to like focus and read all of them, but now getting to look at the list there there are names that i'm i'm uh pleasantly surprised are not on the list uh and then there's some that are surprising this one is a little surprising given that they were still using her and she was just in the chamber but maybe she was just in the chamber because the other two were in the chamber yeah um i wouldn't be surprised if she gets brought back once this is all said and done and maybe they repackage her even but uh for now, at least uh, Eric's still still on the payroll. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I, I mean, I, I kind of would have, I would have done the same thing in regards to like rebrand her as like you know, like the the manager or the valet for the War Raiders, you know, because they have that gimmick going. Or like I wanted to at one point. I would have slapped Liv and Sarah with the tag belts and given Ruby either the Raw or SmackDown belt. Yeah. Have them ramp, like, run shit in the women's division for a while. But it just seemed like that wasn't ever come to pass. So it's just like, hmm. She's the second person on my list that stands out 
of like, wow, you got fired, and it sucks. But again, it, it, it's victim of circumstance. Hopefully, she gets brought back. And ho- hopefully, this is ultimately better for her career. But I know that in the in the moment, it's it sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kamish, I'm not really shocked that she was on your list because I know you've been a big advocate for the Riot Squad for a long time. Um, but yeah, because you could do so much with those three. Like, if you had kept them together, you had given them more time. Like, you could have slapped belt on them, or you could have had this dynamic of they run the women's division as a team, or even doing like the whole. What, what's that rule of tag free bird? teams? Where, yeah, the free bird rule. Introduce that into the women's division. That would have been interesting. Well, not to piss anybody off, but I think what really diminished their believability was when they got fed to Ronda and would lose in a minute. Uh. So, I mean, just just saying. But um, moving on, uh, we got the Good Brothers, Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows. Um, kind of weird with this one, because I think that they originally wanted to quit like a year ago and then they got paired with AJ and they had all this, you know, TV time, tag team championships. They were like dead center of the Boneyard match with Taker and Styles. Um, But I think inevitably uh, we knew for a fact that these two were eventually going to get let go, which is a shame because I think that if you gave proper booking to the Revival and to the Good Brothers... That would have been your two pillars for the tag team division. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, with with these two, like, yeah, at first there was the rumor a year ago. It's like, oh, they want out. They want to leave. Then they get an extension. Then they're reunited with AJ, like a quote-unquote bullet club reunion named the OC due to trademark reasons. Yeah. Um, And it, it, it just... I I don't know, like, with this one, it's like, maybe this is a blessing in disguise for them, maybe it's not, I mean, I I know AJ's not going to go anywhere with his extension, because he said, one last extension and I'm done with my career. Yeah. So it's like, Anderson and Gallows, either if they go back to New Japan, or if they do something else, like... Who knows at this point? But it, it's still kind of like one of those that's like, is it good? Is it bad? Like, that's how I feel with these two. For, for me, I, I know these guys have been doing it for a long time also. So I wouldn't even be surprised if maybe, now we haven't really heard anything about this, but maybe they're at, at the tail end of their stuff too. Um, or maybe they're going to, maybe they'll hop over to AEW for a minute too. But. Only time will tell. It, it it is surprising given their recent prominence that they decided on these guys, and we've always talked about how shallow the tag divisions are anyway. It's 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 unfortunate, but um, this next guy I feel like probably had the quickest burial when he came to the main roster. We got EC three, Ethan <laughs> Carter the third. Um, I will go back to the specific moment where in my mind, I was like, that's it. This is Vince's way of directly telling this guy, I'm through with you. Where Braun Strowman chokeslammed him through the stage. And, you know, I think Renee Young's reaction sort of said it all. Um, at that point, I was like, that's it. Like, you're done. Like, that's it. There is, they're not going to try to push you anymore. The guy, like, feuded for with Ambrose when he was still there for, like, two weeks. He won a match. He lost a match. Then they had that uh, choke slamming through the ramp. And that was it. EC3 was not spoken of. He was not heard of. You would see him occasionally when they had, um, you know, a bunch of guys running after the 24-7 championship. You would see EC3 in that, in that crowd. But that was it, you know? So... <laughs> Isn't he at least a one-time 24-7 champion, though? I thought he got it once. Yeah, he got it, but then he lost it like 20 seconds later. <laughs> okay, hey, give, give credit where credit's due for one run. 20 seconds? <laughs> short. I mean, it's 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 awfully short notice. I mean, the thing with EC3, like, in NXT, he was, he was coming up. He was okay. Before that, what, he was 
in Impact. Yeah. And he was one of their main heels. He was one of their top guys. And, it, and all of a sudden, like, he gets brought up to the main roster. It's like, and we're done with you. Well, we've always talked about how that's Vince's Vince's way to lunge, lunge and assert his dominance is that he'll take a, a person that's fresh from impact and just squash him. <laughs> so bad. Uh, yeah. Is, is it un- is it unfortunate because of the fact that he had gone from WWE to Impact, made a name, came back, and then just got swept under the rug again? Um, do I think again, like to a degree, you got to look at it from a like I hate to draw this comparison, and uh, I'm, I don't think EC3 is ever going to be able to follow the same path. But you've got things like Drew McIntyre, who is a prime example of. I left, I turned my life around, I came back. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe this isn't, isn't the worst thing for some of, some of these people. EC3 could, could again, it, it's a really easy line to draw, but EC3 could jump over to AEW and revitalize this whole thing. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um... I actually forgot to mention that in the beginning, you know, Drew McIntyre was the one name that kind of came to mind when I saw all these guys released. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, there is such a thing as blessing in disguise. And, you know, you ask Drew, who ironically currently is your WWE champion. This might be what's best for some of these guys. But again, time will tell. Um... Next one, and uh, he was actually very emotional. He even put up a two-minute video stating how he felt about his release. Um, Drake Maverick, uh, I think probably the most solid booked out of the out of all these guys who've been released. You know, first he was GM of Two Hundred Five Live, um, had a brief stint with AOP and Sheamus and Cesaro. Um, yeah, there was that whole urinating angle. Um, but, you know, I, I liked the whole thing with the 24-7 championship. I thought that he and R-Truth kind of played off each other very well. But um, he was actually circled in to be a part of that Cruiserweight tournament, which he said he would still participate in. Um, but he was very emotional. Like, he, it looked like it, this had really impacted him. Um I don't know. He 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 was entertaining for for the segments that he was in. But what do you guys think? I think it's unfortunate based on on the prominence that uh, he'd been given because he's a little worker. He's charismatic. I didn't always find him to be palatable. He's kind of annoying, but uh, he he's one of those guys who you give something and he says, all right, I'm going to commit to that because that whole 24 uh, seven angle with our truth was campy and ridiculous, but it worked. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's sad to, to see somebody like that go, but I, there's no doubt in my mind that he's going to come back as soon as there's money for them to pay him because I think he's he's been one of those workhorses that WWE knows they can rely on. Yeah. I, I would have left him as the GM of 205. I mean, even as a competitor in 205 because honestly, he fits the bill of a good cruiserweight. He fits that ranking of like, all right, you know, this is a guy who can actually work. I mean, he had that stint for a while with uh, Mike Canellis, you know, as GM of 205, and Mike was being disobedient, so they had to prove it in a match who ran shit. Yeah. And I liked it. I, I, I also found him annoying, just like Dan would, in certain situations, but other ones, it's like, all right, you fit perfectly with this. But other things, it's like, yeah, I do feel bad because it seems like he made WWE his life. And, yeah. and like when, when you're one of those people who puts their all into something you're passionate about, it sucks that it gets taken gets away from you. Yeah. And that's the other side of it is that I, I think he's, I think he's flexible because we've seen him do the, the silly campiness and we've seen him do the, the, the more serious roles. He, he, he'll work wherever they need him. And I think that that's why he, he will be back. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually realized that there was someone uh, who was released today that's missing from the list that I have, but I'll, I'll group them together with the next person who is on the list. Um, Zack Ryder and Kurt Hawkins. Um, these two, uh, let me just say this. Kurt Hawkins, I felt like they never really had anything. I thought that you could have really built a very emotional storyline where he was losing like 200, like he was uh, um, 0 and 200 at one point. You could have built that as like, you know, Kurt Hawkins, you know, comeback story. Um, but it never went anywhere. Zack Ryder, uh, I give props to this guy because he got over on like by himself at a time where the internet wasn't really used um, to a superstar's advantage. You know, he got pushed and then Embrace the Hate came along. Um, a few years later, um, once again, he wins at Money in the Bank at WrestleMania. Uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Money in the Bank. It was a ladder match for the IC title. He wins it. Not 24 hours goes by and he loses it. So I don't know if it kind of became like a running joke of like how quickly can we kill his push. But um, again, I thought that if you group these two together, build on them, you could have once again had a pillar for your tag team division. What do you guys think? Well, like, he, definitely, he definitely paved the way for the likes of Xavier Woods. Yeah. I, I also have to be like... It, in awe of what Ryder has provided for some of these superstars to really think outside of just WWE. Because, you know, nowadays, as we've currently seen, one job is never secure. But when you start branding yourself out there everywhere else, it's like, all right, well, I fell from one endeavor, but I still have this. I'm still earning from this venture. So Zack Ryder is a pillar of like innovating people to like stay on top of their game in regards to like oh you know I got to do this for my career or else that's all she wrote. With Hawkins, it's like he deserved some kind of push, but it just sucks this this whole oh and however many losses at this point type angle too. Yeah, and, and to to your point. This wave of releases uh, shows how dire this is to WWE because we we've known them to be hoarders, for lack of a better term, where they will they won't use somebody for eight months, but they'll still keep them on the payroll and and refuse to release them. Mike and Maria being a, being a prime example. And then you get to a, to a moment like this where Drake and Zach and Kurt and someone else we haven't gotten to just yet um, are, are reliable workers and people you have tried to push in the past that you almost in any other, any other day you look at them and go yeah they're they're, pro- they're probably set and then we get here and all it took was a minute. Well, Dan, I think I know who you're talking about, and ironically, he's the next guy on the list. Pro- I mean, I'm going to be honest when I say this. Probably the most shocking to me on the list, um, Heath Slater. Um, I think he wrote in his, um, in his Instagram that it had been 16 years that he had been with the company, which is mind-boggling to think. Um... Heath Slater, I think at first, you know, came in, actually was pretty solid with the Nexus. So there was that stint. Um, And I hate to say it, but John Cena doing what he does uh, didn't give that group the push. Um, Heath Slater kind of goes like in between, you know, the core um, gets out of that, starts taking on like, you know, a more gimmicky gimmick. Um, but I think at some point you just kind of fell in love with the guy, you know, you would cheer for him. You were hoping that he would kind of get a, a push, uh, which he did with Rhino. You know, they, they had the whole, I have kids thing, which really got over. But then I think a month later they took it away. Um, yeah, I, I was, I was the most shocked with, with, with this one, with Heat Slater. I thought that if they really gave him a chance, he could really do something, um, but much like most of these guys, they just pulled the plug on the guy and kind of kept him 
you know, in catering until they needed someone, you know, for him to, you know, job to. So, what? Do, where are you guys with Heath Slater? His, his time is coming. I should take this as the opportunity to follow the remaining members of the three-man band and be like, I got fired. This opens my eyes. I'm going to get jacked. And I'm coming for the WWE Championship when I get hired. I mean, if that were to happen, like, I definitely do. I, I think you could definitely repackage him uh, if he if he finds a way to bulk up a little bit. You can't tell me that I don't even know where the hell gender is right now, but you can't tell me that a triple threat match for the WWE Championship featuring 3MB wouldn't be wouldn't put butts in the seats. <laughs> I would. Are you ready to watch that pay per view? I would absolutely watch the replay on the WWE Network um, for a non negotiable but very reasonable price of just only nine ninety nine. Yeah, no, this one. Yeah. This is surprising, like like you said, because he's another one of, one of your uh, reliable reliable uh, players. No matter when you need somebody, what segment you need, if you need a job or if you need a filler segment, if you need somebody to run around in the 24, 7, 48, uh, I don't know, all this stuff. He said. It's the 24, 7, 48, 7, 11, I-95. North European television title. Wow, yeah, impressive. He, he, he's all over the place. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no matter what you needed, need from him, uh, he's, he's there. He's there for you. And uh, I look forward to it, to his, his uh, imminent return. I do, too. Like, I, I don't see this as the end for him. It, 16 years is a long time. Yeah. That that was the shocker to me, and yeah, the whole he's got kids. It's like yeah, we know that, but it's like come on, like really, this is your guy. This was one of your guys that you can rely on for anything. Um, <laughs> I just thought about it in my mind. You know, the 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 day when he returns, I could just imagine his promo. He's like, yeah, I was fired, but god damn it, I got kids, so I need this job. Um. Yeah, if you have a short-haired Heath Slater come back, and that's his promo, and he doesn't deliver the kid's line as, like, a joke, but it's like a semi-serious throwback, that'll be a winner. That promo will be will be uh, amazing. Bebe. Um, <laughs> going down here, um, I, I think, Kamish, you've been referring it all, to it all along, victim of circumstance. This next guy we got here, Eric Young. Um... When this guy was insanity, I thought that was a very solid group. I kind of thought about it today. You know, you have Nikki Cross, who was in that group. You know, now she's doing good things with Alexa Bliss. You had um, Alexander Wolf, who is now in Imperium, and he's doing good. Killian Dane, who wasn't doing so good, but he went back to NXT. And not that he's doing the best thing that he could possibly do, but it seems like he's still secure. And Eric Young just kind of got the short end of the stick. They did nothing with this guy. Once again, he was a big deal in TNA, so maybe that might have affected it. But, um, yeah, just uh, whatever he was given, it was just jobbing and losing and start-stop, and that was it. I've kind of seen this trend. If you were at one point, at first, a WWE superstar, and then you went to TNA, and then you got brought back, you won't get buried. But if you originally started your career in TNA, oh, that shovel's coming for you. <laughs> it's because WWE likes to build their own. Uh-huh. Even though certain few like Goldberg were not their own, yet they, yet they get a push. Yeah. It, uh, it, you know, I mean, that maybe that's a conversation for another day, because honestly, I'm a little confused as to why we put our eggs in the Goldberg basket so frequently. Dan? Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Why? why? Why is Goldberg such a big deal? Anyway, point is, uh, yeah, Eric, Eric Young had, had a okay little start in, san, in sanity, but, um, yeah, it... it t- it petered off and uh, faded into the wind. 
So Just in the wind. Fate of Black. So, I, I mean, if he if he ever gets a chance to come back, who knows? He probably won't be outside the mid card anyway. He probably yeah. won't even be outside of the lower card. Agreed. Agreed. But, yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of those people I think is going to benefit more in the long run by this release. Um, but, yeah, going back, once again, still sucks. <laughs> Yeah, um, so we're down to what on this list is the last person, but then I realized that we actually forgot someone on the list, so this is actually the second to last person. We have Leo Rush, um, someone who was doing good in 205 Live, came to the main roster, there was speculation that he was being difficult, had some time off, came to NXT, was doing very, very well. He could do some very impressive stuff in the ring. Um, I think, once again, got lost in the shuffle, and here we are. So, where where are you guys with Leo Rush? Well, and he's still slated for the cruiserweight thing, too. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know how that's going to work when you fire someone, and then it's like, no, but you're still performing for us. Okay. Well, I, I mean, to, to, I suppose in a way they're still contractors, so you can say, all right, well, your end of date is actually this day. They're, if they aren't facing each other, they're both going to lose. <laughs> uh, they would. They would do that. I, that's, that's the reality of the booking around that. I would think that because he learned his lesson when he was difficult on the main roster, and he took his time off, he found a way to rebrand himself. Like, all right, take me serious. I'm here to compete. And when he came back to, like, NXT and 205 Live, he was getting a good push. He was going on a good run for a while. Yeah. And to put him in the Cruiserweight tournament, I would be like, all right, he's probably, like, one of my top two choices to win it all. And hell, like, I don't know if you guys caught this through social media, but... You know the story with, like, Bobby and Lana, how he might need a quote-unquote divorce? Yeah. Leo Rush put it into the Twitterverse saying, like, hey, you know, I think it's time for you and I to fix what needs to be fixed. And maybe you need the right push for a manager again. But I think if you were to rebrand Leo Rush as Bobby Lashley's manager, we wouldn't get the whole, ah, funny, ah, funny. Bullshit, but we would probably get like, all right, you want a good run? You want to go after Drew McIntyre? You're going to listen to me and not to the broad. Ooh. The broad. <laughs> the, hey, be very careful when you talk about Cousin Anal. About, uh... <laughs> well, speaking of Cousin Anal, um, the, the name that actually wasn't on this list, but thankfully I remembered... Um, I was confused why he hadn't come up because that's yeah, really true. That's really who I was alluding to. Um, Rusev. Uh, again, I hate to go back to John Cena, but Rusev was doing pretty good, and then he faced John Cena, and then what we got kind of happened. Um, Rusev. Are you I talking about when he debuted and fought John Cena, or did I forget about a feud? I'm talking about when he uh, faced John Cena at WrestleMania and lost, and that pretty much triggered a downward spiral for his career. Um, which thankfully got addressed in the Fiend match at WrestleMania, but that's a story for a different time. Um, I think Rusev was always trying to re-innovate himself. Uh, different hairstyle, different you know uh, mustaches and goatees, the whole Rusev Day thing. Um, at one point, it was so over, and they actually, the, the stars kind of aligned at WrestleMania 34 in a fatal four-way where he had an opportunity to win the U.S. championship, but they gave it to Jinder only to take it off like less than a month later. And Rusev, I think, only got one title opportunity, but uh, very ironically, his first post since being released was God is good. Life is good. It seemed like he's keeping a very positive mindset, uh, you know, after his release. 
I think it's a crime because, again, he could have been a very good asset to the company, um, very promising, you know, and he's built up. He's a big dude. Um, yeah, I just I think it's it's a crime that he didn't he never got that well deserved push. Yeah, he was getting a, he was getting his shit together. He had just gotten his citizenship. I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna go down the dark conspiracy road for just a, just a second because I think I had, I had read a while back online that there were like rumors that maybe WWE was gonna put, do what WWE is not not known for doing, and that was trying to break up that marriage. What? <laughs> Yeah, they've, they've ruined relationships before by putting couples on opposite brands and that sort of thing. Um, so, wow. I mean, it's poss- it's possible that mm, the decision to drop Rusev could have something to do with, well, maybe this is a prime opportunity for us to try and put that last nail in the coffin of that, that marriage. I don't know where those two are uh, in real life right now i don't know they're standing with each other but uh i hope that's not the case yeah in, uh, in all seriousness like with that with no gimmicks or anything i know we sometimes talk about not liking angles or anything but i hope not i really hope that's not the agenda but if it is god have mercy on their souls seriously i, I mean I, I think their relationship and marriage is still intact i, I mean it seems like like in going into that dark path that they tried, but I think they they stood above it. But yeah, my my whole thing here is I'm surprised that he made the the list for this because of the fact that he had just it just recently had the pro, the promo with those two, and I don't know maybe here here's another another musing. Maybe they're gonna split up Lana and Bobby, and we're gonna see Lana get cut too. Yeah, that, that's kind of the thing I was thinking of at the same time. Well, because I mean, they've certainly been planting seeds, and uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys uh, noticed, but Rusev w- got bumped from the Rumble. Um, was not even in WrestleMania in any capacity. So I don't know if he was going down that Heath Slater route where it's like, yeah, we're not going to see you for about eight or nine months, but when we need to kind of freshen things up, uh, you can cut your hair, you can shave and, you know, we'll bring back a rejuvenated Rusev to pop, to pop the crowd. Um, well, now that we've gone through all the superstars, am I missing anybody? Ember Moon. Ember Moon. Damn. Um, uh, I thought about it. I think the one person that got the shortest end of the stick was Ember Moon. Because I think I would tell you guys all the time, the best that she got was being a participant in Money in the Bank matches. Um, she got one title match against Bailey, which she lost. Then the storyline was dropped, and then I think she got injured, and she just never got that push. Like, not even, like, a semi-push, you know? She was just kind of there, would lose, um, and, I mean, she did great things in NXT, and, again, a sh- really, it's really a crime that she never got a push. And I know she she is part of uh, a lot of the up up down down stuff, so yeah. I don't know how, how that's going to impact any of Xavier's shows and backstage. Yeah, like come on, you you had her on backstage pretty consistently lately, and you couldn't uh, you couldn't keep her on the damn payroll for that. She well, was wasn't that a different payroll though? Isn't that from Fox? It might be, so maybe we'll still still see her. Maybe that's why WWE didn't feel bad. They were like, well, shit, you're getting paid by Fox. Like, just get off our payroll for a minute. We'll bring you back if we... If you don't we, need two paychecks. You really need when you're more. healed. Is, is she still, she's still recuperating the ankle, isn't she? Yeah, she yeah. was injured, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe it, was, maybe it was a handshake agreement with, with her that... All right, we're going to cut you from our stuff, but 
once you're healed. We'll see. I mean, she still seemed pretty heartbroken. So, I mean, I don't know. It's it, it's a serious time with the whole pandemic, and then you have people getting cut. It's 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 a really serious thing. Um, now we come down. Uh, anybody else, wrestler wise, that I might have missed? Not that I'm aware. Of. No. Okay. Um, I'm gonna group uh these guys together, and then if there's someone in particular that you guys want to address, we can do that. We have the producers of the show. We got Kurt Angle, Billy Kidman, Mike Rotunda, Pat Buck, Fit Finley, Sean Devari, Scott Armstrong, Sarah Stock, Shane Helms, and Lance Storm. Um, the two people to me that probably stand out more than anyone is Kurt Angle and Fit Finley, with Scott Armstrong being a very close um, number three, um, Kurt Angle, you know, uh, literally just a year ago that he retired in the ring, um, Fit Finley has been there since forever, um, you have people like Trish Stratus, you know, talk about how Fit Finley was very, um, uh, instrumental in her career, so that just tells you how long this guy has been doing his thing, um, shocking, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the deal is. You have people like Lance Storm who I don't even think it's been a year since the guy started being a a producer. Now all of a sudden all these guys are let go. Uh, What are your guys' thoughts? Uh, The thing I was going to say is uh, the thing you have to keep in mind with the Kurt Angle thing is that unfortunately despite his impact on the business as a whole, um, like you said, He's only technically been in that producer role for a hot minute. And with people like Kidman, Armstrong, uh, Lance, uh, Fit, and I'm blanking on the other names. I'd have to look at the actual list. Um, And maybe not even so much Lance, except for the fact that he's been around a long time, too. Um, I feel like you couldn't have really gotten away with saying, okay, we're going to keep Kirsch and then release all the other guys. Yeah. Yeah. so I'm not in in the whole I'm in the in the big picture of the producer releases. I'm not surprised Kurt was let go. In general, it's surprising that that individual is on there. Fifth, I think, is the biggest surprise to me as yeah. a collective because he's been so instrumental in so many people's careers. Yes. Well, I was going to say the same thing. Where it's like, okay, with Kurt, it's like, well. Victim of circumstance. Now, Finn Finley, the guy's been in the wrestling business for years. And he's actually had a major influence on the women's division. Yes. For what it is. And that's what kills me, where it's like, do you believe in that division so much? It's kind of like, lately, fans are more interested in that than they are the men's division. A name that stands out to me as well is Mike Rotunda. Yeah, because his kids are still active wrestlers. I mean, well, I haven't seen Bo for a while, but obviously with Bray Wyatt being the hottest thing right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to put it out there, but if we see a wave two, I'm not going to be surprised if Bo's on that list. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I again, not to take credit away from any of the other guys. Again, Billy Kidman, Scott Armstrong, who was a f- you know formal a referee, then kind of transitioned into a backstage role. These guys have been there for years. Isn't um, Scott really close with Triple H? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, if somebody that close to Triple H is, is getting the boot, <laughs> nobody's safe. I mean, because I know previously you had guys like Arn Anderson, um, Road Dog, you know, all yeah. these other guys who just kind of were given the boot. And I don't know, like those veterans that you need to have, especially in times like this, if you're narrowing them down and replacing them with new ones or not even having, you know, limiting the amount of producers that you have as a whole, kind of risky, you know, at this point in time. Brian's still in there, isn't he? I, I didn't think he got fired. Road Dog. Um, if I last I recall, I know he was let go, and I, did he come back? I'm not sure right now. 
No, he's still a producer. Oh, still a producer? Okay, so scratch that one. But again, I go back to people like Arn Anderson who were let go earlier. Um, again, you're limiting that veteran status that you need to have, you know? Um, yeah, that's right. That, sorry, that's right. Uh, Road Dogg and, and Scott are brothers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's tough. It really is tough. But um, we come down. I'm, I'm going to group these two together. So announcers, we have Aiden English. And then referees, once again, a big shocker to me, Mike Chioda. The um, veteran. What was that? The veteran. Yeah. Um, very quickly, Aiden English. Um, garbage push uh, when uh, he split from uh, Simon Gotch. Um, for a second, he was with Rusev, and he kind of got that whole thing over, and then just kind of went to the commentary table, and that was it. Um, Mike Kyoto, like, you want to talk about memorable referees? There's always two that stick out to me, Earl Hebner and Mike Kyoto. Um, I, I don't know, like, this, I don't, don't know what... Don't the... you forget about Nick Patrick. Mm-hmm. Commi- he said it, Kamish, not me. Um, I, I didn't say anything. Well, because I know Nick Patrick doesn't exactly have a sweet spot in your heart, so... He's a tool. There he is. <laughs> um, no, yeah, but I, I don't know. Like, we've been losing veterans, like, in different parts. Like, you think back to Jim Johnson, the guy who literally produced all the music for the Attitude Era. He's gone. You have veterans like Mike Kyoto, like in regards to referee, now he's gone. So, I I don't know. I don't, like, you guys who, can go who, ahead. Who's your current veteran ref, Charles, what? Charles Robinson, yeah. Yeah, that, that's all we got. And to me, it's like, well, if I, don't, if I can't see Charles running down that long-ass... <laughs> entryway at Mania, I, I can damn sure see uh, Mike doing it, but it's like, I don't even have Mike anymore. Yeah. Dan? Um, yeah, uh, like, like you said, he's, he's one of the, the most prominent referees, and to... Have him get like I I don't I don't remember if we've seen him lately. Has he been actively refereeing? I haven't. Seen Not him. that I recall. No. So maybe that's maybe that's why. Maybe he was just on the payroll because of because of everything he he contributed. But we got to the point where it was all right. Sorry, Mike. You gotta go. We still got Charles. <laughs> Um, cause I know like it was last year where on YouTube, uh, WWE exclusively did like a 15 minute thing where they, you know, said like, oh, inside, you know, the most, uh, um, the most, the well-known referee, long tenured referee in the WWE, Mike Kyoto. And they had little interviews and, you know, we got to know the guy, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It must be pretty serious down there when you're releasing both people who are well established as well as people who you've, you've only had for a short amount of time. But um, yeah, we've reached the end of that list, and um, it's scary to think that there's more on the way. But um, any final comments from you guys about um, these guys collectively as a whole? These guys and girls who've been released. Um. I, I hope we see some of them back. Some of them, like I said, it's it's hopefully they're in a better place. Um, but you know, it's it's hard it's hard to hear this this news in general. Because, and I, I know that it's almost one of those things that you're a little desensitized to, given the fact that we we get a regular wave of this pretty much annually. Yeah. But especially given the circumstances and when you're in a situation uh, such as a lot of people nowadays, myself included, and your your job starts to have to make reductions, you have people close to you. You have people that you've grown to care about yeah. that are in the same position these guys are in. 
And I'm sure that a lot of the, the wrestlers are, are sitting at, at home going, ah, oh, shit, Drake, man. Oh, Gallows, Anderson. <sighs> Hope to see you on the other side. But it's going to be, it's going to be hard. Um, I know, <laughs> I'm, I know that a lot of them probably have a decent, decent amount of money, or I would hope so, but they also probably live a little bit more expensive than some of us do. So I hope they get out the other side stronger and I hope we see some of them back and I hope that the others thrive wherever they end up, but good luck to everybody involved. Well said. Uh, I'll... Yeah, he said it. <laughs> he said, he's, well, he said what I felt. I, it's the same thing, you know. Hopefully, there's greener pastures on the other side. You know, like, like with some of the people, it's like, well, I hope you do come back. You come back stronger than ever. You know, hopefully, this doesn't last as long as it's been lasting. And there's better days ahead for everybody. Um, now, before we wrap up, a uh, quick question I want to ask you guys is that who would be a superstar whom you're hoping at this point in time is still employed, but you would not want to see on that released list? Is there someone that you guys are hoping that they still keep? Uh, for me, Liv is one of them. Yeah. I'm concerned that she's just at the threshold where WWE might be, might look at her and go, well, we kind of had a plan for you, but eh, we're not far enough in to where it matters, and then they cut her. I'm hoping that's not the case. That, that's probably the one I can think of, the only one I can really think of. Um, I don't mean to just say this as the gimmick, but considering the fact that this makeshift group has kind of been seen split as of recent on TV... I'm hoping that Cesaro is not on the chopping block for that. Because I know we saw Shinsuke come out all alone last Friday and challenge Braun Strowman. Um, so I don't know if they're playing around with that idea of, you know, splitting everybody that was in a makeshift team and thinking about letting some people go. Um, but yeah, I, I think that even with the, 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 the list that we had today with all that released talent... Not to say those guys aren't talented, but again, victim of circumstance, I'd say, more than anything. So, yeah, um, I guess that's it. So, once again, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Let us know in the comment section below um, who you were bummed out the most to see uh, released, um, who you're hoping will still be employed uh, during this difficult time. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below and we will see you all next time.